Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most beneficent, a very pleasant morning. I would like to wish to everyone here and welcome to the finals of the 2012 English language debate for the Prime Minister's Challenge Trophy. The motion for today is this house believes that secondary schools should substantially expand vocational training. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I call upon the Prime Minister, Abdul Razak bin Hazrin Fazail. The floor is yours. Before I start my speech, let's make this clear that I'm Prime Minister and I dedicate my speech to all my friends here that's watching me right now. Given that, our South African hero, Mr. Nelson Mandela once said, that knowledge is a weapon that can change the world. The problem is, we sense a flaw in our education system right now, ladies and gentlemen. A flaw which screams impracticality. A flaw which screams total focus or extreme heavy focus on only theories, concepts, disregarding the fact that the vocational aspect of education is also important. Therefore, we propose the motion. Our defi definition is clear. What we mean by vocational training is educational training that provides practical experience with specific skill set to suit a particular occupation. This is contrasted to the current system which heavily focuses on only theory and concepts. An example would be examples would be things like retailing, landscaping or manufacturing. All these aspects of education is what we call vocational education. Given that, what we mean by substantially expanding can be explained through our mechanism which is firstly, we will require all students of all streams in upper secondary level to take up a vocational subject on top of the compulsory subjects within the stream. Which means that, for example, if you take the science stream and you have to take the subjects biology, chemistry and physics, you must also take another vocational subject ranging from a few choices. Those choices are, are inclusive but not limited to emergency medical services, electronic technology, nuclear training technology, and many other things which are within the stream of science. This also applies to any other streams you take arts or you take commerce. That said, secondly, this applies to all public schools because that's where government's jurisdiction falls on. Thirdly, instructors for this particular course will be trained before commencing education. Like any other subject you want to introduce, we will have a few shortages of teachers first, but as time progresses, we will have sufficient enough of workforce to cater to the amount of students taking up for this particular course. Lastly, the qualification and certification you get upon completion of your high school, now that you have both vocational and academics allows you to apply for the specific career you studied for. If you studied for emergency medical services, for example, now you can apply for paramedic because you qualify. You will also be accredited a level 3 Malaysian skills certificate, which also vocational schools provide on a higher level, but because this is secondary school, we have to provide level 3, which is sufficient. Explanation will come later. I'll be talking about two things. Number one, I'll be analyzing the purpose of high school education and why it's important here. Secondly, I'll go, let's have a chat about the development of Malaysia and what's important for our country. Before that, any points of clarification? Good. So number one, let's analyze the purpose of education. The purpose of education right now, on a first level, like any other provision of rights from the government, be it minimum wage or minimum standards of health, governments must always provide the bare minimum when it comes to education as well. What's the bare minimum from our side? Our bare minimum is that it, it allows you to create upward mobility when you graduate from high school. This means the ability for you as an individual to climb up the ladder of specialization in the workforce. Because right now, when you take up your high school graduation certificate, it would not change the fact that the only jobs or only occupations you can apply for are jobs like cashiers or cleaners or salespersons, which aren't necessarily bad, but it's it, they, those are also occupations which you can get without any high school graduation certificate. Therefore, it becomes redundant. We think that the importance of creating upward mobility is to allow an individual to specialize on a particular job because you have the skill set to do it and you have already learned how to do it. That's why it's important. We think the purpose of education is not 
catered to right now because you study for SPM and you graduate from high school, but then you have no use of all the knowledge you've learned. That's why you have to incorporate vocational education within the system right now to ensure that it's better off for those students. On the second level, let's analyze maximization of employability because it's also within the duty of the government to ensure that the people's rate of employment increases. You must understand one thing, that employers would always want the easy way out. And for them, what's easy is that those students are already, a, uh, are already equipped with all those specific knowledge and skill set. And they don't have to provide any private training for them. What we have here is that we have to be practical. Obviously, not all students in all secondary schools should take both a full-fledged course of vocational academics, uh, sorry, vocational education and also academic ed education. But what we can have here is to incorporate both. You would allow for those employers to be more willing to employ those individuals because they know for a fact those individuals are already skillful. That's why it's important and that's why it's the role of the government to provide for the people. Yes. But if vocational industries are already failing to begin with, then what's the prerogative of the government to ensure that everyone can work in this industry? I'm sorry, if it's failing, then doesn't that mean you must bring it back to success and doesn't that mean you must revive the industry? I don't get it. Because just because it's failing, it doesn't mean you neglect it all the way. That's a mismatch from that side. Secondly, let's analyze the development of Malaysia because we know for a fact that only 29% of our high school graduates end up in tertiary education. Most of them get absorbed into the workforce without any particular specific skill set. On the first level, we are a nation that aspires to be first world and developed. And according to the o Organization of Economic and Cooperation Development, our high school workers must comprise of 40% of, of our labor force if we want to get that status. The thing is, in Singapore, 48% of their labor force is high-skilled. In Hong Kong, 52% of their labor force is high-skilled. In Malaysia, only 28% is high-skilled. The problem here is very simple. How do you expect our country to reach that standard if our labor force is that low and that unqualified? That's the problem. They have to tell us from opposition side how they solve the problem. And at least that problem can be, can be solved with their proposal, whatever they want to do. But the importance of that, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's important to have a large pool of high-skilled workers because then you incentivize more corporations to come to our country and invest. Because when they know they have high, we have high-skilled workers which have lower cost of labor in comparison to Western countries, that's when you incentivize corporations to come here and build factories and create jobs which benefits our economy and our output economic production. That's important. The same way China focuses on vocational education, which allows companies like Apple to outsource their production to China and produce iPads there instead. We want Malaysia to be that particular hub for outsourcing. In conclusion, we should imagine ourselves in the shoes of our students. What's actually best for those students whose life isn't insured, who, which they might not end up to tertiary education after graduation of high school, that they might just get absorbed into the labor force. For the sake of our students, governments must always consider all the different options that are there for their students. And if one option fails, that they end up not getting to university, they have that exit clause to go to become a, prof uh, to become a high skilled worker in a particular specific skill set which we mandate them to take in secondary school. That's important. Because for the sake of our students, no, I'm sorry, for the sake of Malaysia, ladies and gentlemen, we propose. Thank you, Abdul Razak. Now let us invite the opposition leader, Irazalis Binti Ismail, to state the opposition's objections with regard to today's motion. Please welcome her. Ladies and gentlemen, a young philosopher once said, education is the most important element in an individual's life. Therefore, it is also the backbone for a country. Therefore, with proper education, should be equal and diverse for all. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. I bid to Mr. Chair Speaker, the Honourable Judges, worthy opponents, law teammates, and members of this august hall. Following the motion for today, we from side opposition wholeheartedly disagree with it, with our stance as it disrupts the equilibrium in education. 
With this dance, we're going to explain to you on how education system today works in such a way that is equal and balanced. Moreover, we believe that a secondary school should, be treat, should not be treated as a career school, but should be treated as a school of diverse knowledge. We've got three reasons to believe in this, which are our three points. First point, which will be represented by myself with the key phrase, philosophy of secondary education. My second speaker is going to talk to you about two points, and our third speaker is going to rebut all of the points given out by the dashing boys over there, and later summarize our case. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on with the direction. The direction. Hmm, why so early? Yes? That education must always be diverse, like what you quoted in your opening line. Mm -hmm. Isn't vocational education and incorporating it within our system diverse? Sir, ladies and gentlemen, I just started. I'm going to cater to that in my rebuttals. Hold on, boys. The direction coming from side opposition is simple. First, we're just going to follow status quo. We agree that secondary schools should have a compulsory set of subjects that is diverse. These are the schools that will prepare you to specialize later on in tertiary education. But there's a difference between the specialization that we are proposing and what they are proposing. We are proposing general specialization while they are proposing specific specialization. Ladies and gentlemen, now let me move on to the rebuttals. We have a problem with the characterization coming from side opposition. They talked about, uh, they, they talked about how um, currently we are only going theories and we are not really practical in the secondary school. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason why we do that. No, thank you. Sit down. First, we say that theories can always be used everywhere and we can always change. We can use that theories in application. Therefore, theories will go to practicalities. But if you only learn a vocational stuff, you only learn how to do practically, you don't know the theories, therefore you can't innovate, you can't do and produce other things. This no, is something we are not neglecting that is wrong. No, thank you. Sit down. And then their mechanism right, 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 is that they want to... They want to make people take vocational subject as well as a compulsory subject. But ladies and gentlemen, that is similarly to status quo. But what you as a government have to do for today is you have to prove to us if you change your mechanism, it will substantially expand, ladies and gentlemen. But this is not substantially expanding. It's similarly with different a little changes in the system. No, that is wrong characterization coming from Prime Minister itself. Sit down. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first point, purpose of high school. Ladies and gentlemen, we agree, yes, we agree that the students for today has to be mobile. But that is also under our case, which we will pro produce later. It's very touristic coming from Prime Minister. Secondly, they talked about the labor force today, right? And we only have 29%. Seriously, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that Malaysia today, we are progressing to a more service-based system. Why do we have to regress and go back to all of this labor force, ladies and gentlemen? No, this is not it. Thank you. No, thank you. So now, moving on with our case for today. First point, philosophy of secondary education. I've got four sub-points under this main point. Firstly, experimental stage. In 1997, a young philosopher from the University of California did a case study on the transitional period for students. According to this case study, it said that when an individual is a teenager or a child, that's when they figure out their likes and dislikes. Therefore, it's never permanent. They could and they tend to always change their interests from time to time. And we need to give them room to change this interest to achieve their dream that they really want to achieve. We need to give them time to self-actualize. But if you have vocational schools, therefore they will only be career job, ladies and gentlemen. Vocational school is to prepare you for a career, no, for a job. And this is wrong, which brings me perfectly to the second sub-point. But before that, the one that looks like Justin Bieber. Ah, sure. Look, the idea here is very simple. If indeed you take this particular course, it doesn't mean you will only focus on that specific skill set. If you want to apply for tertiary education, you can after graduation. There's no problem. Sit down, boys. See, I knew it. Looks won everything. And besides, I wanted the third speaker anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, what they are proposing is status quo. That is the same thing like what we are proposing. Because in secondary school, you have that kind of option. Even if, even in vocational schools today, even if in a sports school, you still have to take the compulsory five subjects. That is the same thing. That's same like status quo. Don't you understand that? Hold your horses, boys. 
Don't you feel excited to see me? Well, later I'll reconsider. Secondly, no exit clause. Let me just give you a trend analysis of what's happening in status quo. If you currently enter a vocational sports art or any institution that is deemed to be specialized to one subject, it's still compulsory for you to take math, history, and languages, ladies and gentlemen. This is to ensure that you still have a safety net to lie back once if everything fails. And if you follow the government's case, which is supposedly to be the case, you're going to open a dark history that is going to repeat itself. Let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, what happened in the 1900s, where everyone was into mechanics. Then, when the world globalized into machineries, then there was a massive influx of employees. This is what happened Ma in the past, and this is not going to repeat itself if you go with side opposition. No. Third. Um, third sub point is an ever changing revolution of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand that hand on jobs are very relative. They always change. But theories stay consistent. That is why Albert Einstein's theories that he's made thousands of years ago can still be applied now, ladies and gentlemen. But practicalities, they change. Sometimes you can do this and sometimes you can do that. That is why it's important for us to teach the future generation theories and not practicalities. Before building a program, we need to get the formula first. In addition, recently the PMR was abolished. Then these children are going to be trapped in the linear path of education since Form 1. It is not fair because you lock a 13-year-old child, my little sister, from a one line of reality at such a young age. This is, in, this is diabolical, ladies and gentlemen, and this is evil. In the end of the day, what have said exactly? opposition explained to the House. We've already explained to you on how secondary schools work in such a way that's already diverse to begin with. We've already explained to you on how status quo already caters to all of this problem and is equal to begin with. And Prime Minister, or I think the whole opposition bands, are fighting for something that is really minor. So please, check back the motion. And ladies and gentlemen, we care for the future leaders. We care for the education system. So if you care for the education system, you go with that opposition. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ira Zalis Ismail from the opposition bench. Without further delay, let us invite the second minister from the government, Amirun Hamman bin Azram. From government side, we have one aim, which is to, pro which is to produce SPM graduates who are fit to work in a specific career learn. But we also detect a problem where certain students who wants to choose a certain course are not allowed to, go, to pursue with their courses because options are not available for them. In this issue, I'm talking about those students who want to pursue both theoretical studies and also vocational studies. Government is not providing them with that option, and that's a big problem. We from government side want to solve that problem. But before going on to my argument, which predicated around that issue, a few rebuttals for our side. Opposition, okay. Firstly, they talk about how it disturbs the equilibrium of education because you need to have a balance between vocational and also theoretical studies. That's the thing, because in current status quo, in the educational system, there's no balance in its theoretical studies and also vocational studies. In the system right now, we are too focused on uh, theoretical studies that the children, that the students are lack of vocational studies. That's why, for, uh, for an instance, those who graduate from SPM but not qualified to go into universities have no, fall, uh, have no safety net to fall back onto. That's when you, regret, uh, you, uh, you, allow the, uh, you allow the students to go down into the tunnel of misery. We don't want that. We want to produce SPM graduates who are fit to go to the career specific that Sir? they learn. And then they also wanted to uh, uh, argue upon how high school is supposedly for... A high school is an in institution in order for you to prepare yourself. Sit down, girls. High school is an institution for you in order for you to prepare yourself for theater education. Yes, we don't deny that. But then again, there's also another purpose of high school, which is to prepare you for employment. Meaning that with, upon graduation of SPM, you are already capable. You are already qualified to employ yourself in a uh, in a bare minimum, like what my first speaker talked about. That's when the problem comes because SPM graduates don't have uh, don't have that qualification to do so. Because if, if you analyze current status quo, 
what these SPM graduates can do after SPM is only things such as clerk, such as becoming a uh, becoming a salesperson, which can also be done by those who have a lower qualification. We believe that's a problem because in order for, uh, in order for you to sustain yourself within the, uh, within the current situ situation, you need to have an upward mobility, which my first speaker explained to you, whereby you need to climb up that ladder in that workforce area. Sit down. And then they also talk, uh, talk about how when you allow this thing to happen, what happens then is that you abandon theories. You go full-fledged on vocational. Therefore, students won't understand the theories and all. They cannot apply what they learn and such thing. Number one, we're not, uh, we're not abandoning theories. We're, we're basically adding vocational studies within the current system, meaning that you need, to per, you need to take up those compulsory subjects, such as language subjects, such as history, and other alternative, uh, other alternative subjects that you choose upon choosing your streams. But in addition to that, you also need to take vocational stu stu studies, studies such as uh, uh, studies such as services and all the stuff which are uh, which are needed in order for you to qualify to become uh, a paramedic, for an example. We are going on that uh, motion, and, sure. and then they also talk about how you uh, you sure. won't prepare the students for third year education because you sway them. No, not necessarily, because if the students want to go for theater education, if the students uh, choose or opt for going to theater education, it's okay, fine, because you still have the qualification to go to, uh, to, go to universities, to go to theater education. But you need to understand, not every student in this world, not every student in Malaysia go for theater education. Not all qualify for theater education. Sure. You need, uh, the statistics shown that only 29% of students every year qualify to go to tertiary education. Then the question would be, what about the, sorry, those 71% students? Are you just going to abandon them? Because right now, you don't have the skill needed to become uh, uh, something like paramedics or Sir. clerks. Because of that, what happens Fine. then, e. that they will be abandoned by the government. We don't want that. Our policy actually helps the students Sir. because right now, you prepare them with skill sets that are acquired in order for you yeah. to become such thing. Before going on to my argument, Yes. In status quo, if you want vocational training, you can go to vocational school and get it. But why make it compulsory to every single student if the vocational ah. industry is dying and failing to begin with? Okay. Fit, uh, it fits perfectly with my argument because my argument is about those kind of people. My argument is about the people who want to go with vocational studies, but also they want to pursue in mainstream, such as science or commerce studies. My uh, uh, argument will be predicated up upon that. Now, we, we need to analyze current status quo because my argument is about empowering students' choice. Analyze status quo. Government is currently restricting students from making a choice that they want, whereby they are put in a dilemma to choose either to opt for vocational studies or to go with those mainstream studies. That's when it's very problematic because if you want to talk about those students, sit down, who opt for full vocational or those students who opt for full-fledged theoretical studies, it's okay then. But what about those students? Those students who sees benefits in both studies, in both theoretical studies and also in vocational studies. And they want to incorporate both worlds into one system. They can't choose that course because government is currently not offering that course. Now, what happens then is that you force these students to make a split-second decision. A split-second decision that is a life-changing decision. And what happens is that you disallow them to pursue what they want because the government don't offer them such cost. But in our policy, everything changes because right now you remove those restrictions. You remove those dilemmas that the students need to face in order to make a decision. Because now you can learn vocational studies alongside with theoretical studies without abandoning either one of it. That's when you don't, you don't, uh, you don't have a dilemma inside you. You don't need to decide anymore because you, have, you can have both, uh, the best of both worlds. Now, it is practically good because it makes decision making easier. It makes decision making easier for the students. Because you need to understand the magnitude of making a decision. Making a decision is a life changing action, whereby whatever you choose will determine your path. Especially, especially I say, in choosing your course path, your educational path. Because if you go with a uh, science stream, that's the only path that you can have which is open to you in the near future. 
you cannot go on to arts path uh, later on because you don't have the basic skill needed then. So uh, what happens then is that you make this decision making for the students easier. Plus, it's also in line with the government duty to facilitate choice because a good government always assists their citizens to make a good choice. In this case, the students. Because the government cannot say to you that if you want, uh, you need to choose either theoretical studies or vocational studies. But then again, the government can see to the fact that both studies have their own benefits. And if it's combined, it have a greater benefit. Government cannot say that. It, because if government says so, what happens is that the government is limiting the student's choice to make legitimate, uh, legitimate choice, victimizing the children with the system. What do we mean by legitimate choice? Uh, the legitimate choice here means to choose either full vocational or vocational plus theoretical studies. And if you don't provide them with such studies, that's when you're victimizing the students. You're not becoming a government, you're becoming a dictator. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Amirun Haman bin Azram. Now let us invite the second speaker from the opposition, Ilmira Muruni binti Muhammad Harif. Malaysia used to rely heavily on a manufacturing industry, and we agree to that. But Malaysia has moved on from that. We're moving towards the service sector, and that's what our education system should cater to. The same principle of when you break up with a boyfriend, you move on from him and don't give him any second chances, right? And you look for other people, we want to apply the same system in our government. Before that, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. I'm to Madam Chair, Speaker, Honourable Judges, our timekeeper, loyal teammates, worthy opponents, members of the House. On the motion, this House believes that secondary school education should substantially expand their vocational training. We, th we tell you from side opposition that we don't want this to happen because we don't want this to disrupt the equilibrium in the education system. I've got two arguments that I promise to deliver to you under my speech. The first argument is under the key phrase of the natural progression of economies. But secondly, I'll do an evaluation of the job market and how the job market has evolved. Before that, let's deal with whatever side government tried to put up. The problem which the speaker before me had is nobody had any options to pursue a vocational style of living. We tell you, now we understand their problem. They don't actually know what status quo is. Because in status quo, if you want to have a vocational style of living and you want a job, you can have it. And you, the avenue is vocational schools. What do you do in vocational schools in status quo? You have subjects, such as the subjects which they want to propagate. Things like manufacturing and learning those kind of things. But there's also compulsory subjects, such as history and English and maths. These are the kind of things that you have to do in a vocational school. Essentially, it's the same like the proposal which they're doing. That's why we tell you that they're actually, actually proposing status quo. So what difference does it actually make? But secondly, they say they want to make an equilibrium exist in the education system because you want to make people theory and practical. Number one, the Ministry of Education has already clarified that the education system's ratio of practical and theory is 60% theory and 40% practical. So we tell you it's equal to begin with anyway, right? But we tell you that under their case, you only stress on vocational learning. And why is that? Because it's been analyzed that under vo to make vocational education something worthwhile and to make you actually employable, you need at least six hours a week for you to learn just on vocational studies. Compare that and add that to the compulsory subjects that you already have to take. And what if I want to take accounts or a science stream or other streams, right? Without you essentially you overburden a student and you don't make them ready for the job market because it won't be effective learning to begin with, right? But we tell you that even if even if you want to create a safety net, then why create a safety net in an industry that's already dying? In an industry where we're already moving away from the manufacturing uh, from the manufacturing factor of our economy, why do you want to why do you want to create people to become safe only in that era? Yes, sir. Now you need to now you need to understand that vocational studies include services such as catering, such as hospitality. Yeah. Now this side of sectors are needed in order to develop the country. Explain that. Yeah. The thing is, we have vocational schools to cater to that. But why do you have to make it compulsory to every student 
in Malaysia? That's our answer because there is two cases to that. Number one, you can't force everyone to learn vocational studies specifically because you need six hours a week just on vocational training just to learn how to cook. Essentially, you don't have that time and time is finite and you already have five other subjects that's already compulsory. It's overburdening. But secondly, I've already told you it's a safety net that isn't really a safety net because we're not relying on the industry. And I explained to you in my point. Before I go into my point, yes, sir. I'm totally saying that vocational education is not at all useful. No, I'm saying that vocational education is very, very useful. Listen to my case. The fact is we have people, if you want to go into vocational education, you can. And they haven't proven to you that there's nobody working for vocational industries. Because we tell you there is people and there's not much of a problem to begin with. Why make it compulsory to everyone? That's our stance and that's our line of argumentation. Let's move on to my actual, and this is where I need everyone to pay attention because I promise to you it will be awesome. Sit down. Listen to my first argument about the natural progression of economies. You have to analyze that economies rely, don't always rely on only one industry. In the early 90s, we, we relied on agriculture, but later we moved on to a manufacturing industry. But now, in status quo right now, developing countries are moving away from the manufacturing industry and are focusing more on service-based industry. Malaysia specifically, under the economic transformation program, under the made by Pemandu, says that Malaysia is moving more towards a service sector industry. But why are we abandoning this vocational industry to begin with? There's three reasons. Because it's an archaic industry to, uh, it's archaic industry already and we don't need it. But why don't we need it? Number one, these jobs are easily replaceable by machinery. You don't need people to work in factory. You can have machines to work in factories. But secondly, we tell you that with the access of internet, you don't need somebody to fix your car. You can just Google it and fix your car on your own. You don't need these people. But thirdly, these industries can easily be outsourced to China and India who already have a cheap labor market and we can never compete with them when it comes to that section of the labor market. But essentially, yeah. when you're trying to over-subsidize an industry that's already dying, what happens is you're going to create what Stalin did. What Stalin did was he tried to maintain and the agricultural industry, even though we were already moving towards manufacture. What happens is that everybody who was in the agricultural industry kept on going into the industry, but essentially it died and nobody needed it anymore, right? Then what happened then is that people who were in the industry were victimized and they didn't have jobs to begin with. When people and the whole world moved on, they were left behind. That is their case. That is not what we want. Our last argument is the evolution of the job market. Because in terms of human resources, we think that vocational graduates are not what we want to create, right? We tell you that essentially you want to create people polymaths. And what are polymaths? People who can master not only in one thing, but master in a lot of things. Because in the inter interconnected world, you're not as, you're requ required to know a, a lot of things. And not just about the application of it, like what they are trying to say, but every single part of it, right? Essentially what happens under their case is, number one, we already tell you, you're not going to make people actually vocational to begin with because it's not going to be effective learning. But if they want to enforce it, then what happens is that you're going to create students which are specialized only in one thing. And why is that harmful? We tell you that if graduates are not mobile and they cannot move from a department to another department, what happens is that in times of recession, where these industries, especially the vocational industries, get weeded out first because they're not mobile, these are the students that will be victimized. But essentially the creation of further things requires you to know a lot of things and that's what we want to have right we want to have people who know who know not only just vocational training but every single thing and we want to make it equal to begin with the conclusion to our case is this we tell you that vocational training is important yes but it's not for everybody and you cannot force everybody to take this subject especially since it's not a industry that's booming to begin with it's a failing industry why create that as a safety net we don't quite understand we are proud to win this debate. Thank you. We have heard from Elmira Muni binti Mamat Harif from the opposition bench. Now for the third minister, let us call forth Muhammad Azizul Hazik bin Jalil. The late Stephen Covey, the master of self-leadership once said, for one to achieve success, the one needs to create opportunities. And that is what we want. 
We want beneficial options for all students. So that if they were to be, if they were given this choice, they are able to branch out into different education stream, to different futures, to different opportunities. This is a very beneficial policy, and I don't understand why the opposition side say it's not. Before that, assalamualaikum and a very good morning, everyone. My role in today's debate is going to rebut the third speaker, I mean the whole opposition bench. But before that, let's uh, look at the problems I have with the opposition side. First problem was this, that they don't understand what, is a vocation, what vocational education really is. They kept on saying that we need to focus on the service system. And yet, they don't know that the basis of the service system is the practicality of all of this vocational education. For instance, service management, uh, for instance, for instance, wait, I'm putting a fact here, is that we need 327,000 workers uh, who are specially, uh, who are specialized in manufacturing, in servicing, in agriculture to have a full self-sustaining country by the, the year 2020. If we don't start now, when? Especially there's only eight years left. But going on to the second problem that I had, is that this uh, question that is lingers in my mind, what is your solution to the problem at hand? If you consider to the fact that, well, vocational education is useful, and yet we don't have enough amount of people who specialize in all of this uh, vocational, uh, uh, vocational uh, 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 system, where are you going to now solve the problem of the lack of highly skilled labor force? But going on to the third and the most glaring problem that I had with the, government, the opposition side was this contradiction of stance. Knowing how uh, the second speaker stood up and said that we are going to argue why is it compulsory. And yet the very first speaker told you that they are arguing on the stance that we need to create, we do not want to disrupt the equilibrium of the secondary school. Now I don't know where, it, where their case stands on and for that very reason they should fall. But here's, in today's debate, I'm going to rebut speaker by speaker. I'm going to start with the very first one. And she brought only one thing to the table, the purpose of high school. Her logic was that secondary school should not ever uh, delve into uh, education of uh, an occupation. A secondary sh uh, school should not be treated as a career school. And only vocational school is allowed to, be, to, uh, to do this. My first rebuttal to this is why not? Especially when a high school, as what my first speaker has told you before, is supposed to prepare you for the future, for, to give you a mo uh, mobile upward mobility in the nearest future, if we were to couple the theoretical education with the vocational education, we're going to get much more highly intelligent students, highly intelligent graduates, who are now masters in the theory and the practical, uh, practical side of their education. And this is a beneficial policy in our, uh, uh, in our debate, uh, in our case. Because when we make it compulsory for everyone, everyone is now going to be able to master both practicality and theory of their education system. But on the second rebuttal to this, especially when, when in our current status quo, in our current education system, when you only learn the, the, uh, the theory, of all the things that you learn, for instance, biology, and, you, you, and yet you don't know how to practice it in real life, how is it going to be beneficial to you in the nearest future? If you know biology, if you know how cells can divide itself into two, but you, don't, but you work in a, in, a, in, a, in a McDonald's because you don't have the qualification to work in a higher level of, uh, of, uh, of, an, of, of an occupation, how is that beneficial to you? If we were to provide them this vocational education, now they can be highly skilled labor immediately, fresh, out of high school. They can delve into other forms of occupation, and yet at the same time, if they want, they can further uh, uh, pursue the academic uh, side of their education. Before going on to the problematic second speaker, yes, first speaker. The, the reason why secondary school should not be a career school because it's the change is permanent. It's hard for you to change from a vocational kind of student into a theory kind of person. Well, this is the problem that I had throughout the opposition side. They didn't even understand what our mechanism is really is. Because if you look, if you understand, if you listen side the opposition, our mechanism tells you that it's compulsory for you to take one voc voc uh, vocational uh, subject that is pertaining towards your stream that you took. For instance, if you take science and you want to branch out into medic, 
you can choose the, e the EMS vocational subject that can provide you the qualification needed to become a paramedic. If you take commerce, you can take the, uh, the agriculture vocational subject. And after that, you can be a farmer. And this is all the things that's beneficial to in our policy. But going to this uh, idea coming from the second speaker, he talk, uh, she talked about overburden. She says, she says that if we were to implement all this education, uh, uh, our case into the edu current education system, it's going to overburden the students and the students can't cope with it. And this is what echoed throughout the whole bench. My first is one, how are you saying that we cannot even cope to the things that we are learning now? Are you saying that our, we, students, are unable to fully ex uh, understand the vocational education at hand? Uh, and that's just so bigotry to what we stand on. But going on to the second rebuttal to this, is that if you were to uh, apply vocational education with a theoretical education, it's going to be easier. Why? Because no understanding theory is on the other side of the story. Understanding the practicality of the, of, of, of the occupation is the other side of the story. Knowing how in the current education system you can only choose either one and lose out, lose out in the other one, it's detrimental to the student. Now, in our case, we're going to combine both. And now you can master yeah. both theoretical, uh, theoretical and practicality side of the education system that you are in. And this, is, this makes it easier. Because when you understand the theory and you practice it every day for six hours, except like what they said, in a week, you're going to, you're going to master the, education, uh, the subject very easily. But before going on to the second sit down argument that he bought, uh, she bought under the keyword of economy, I quote what he said, or what she said. That is, vocational education is beneficial. In all times, why do you need to take away something that's beneficial to you? Especially when the government has the responsibility to give choices to everyone, it's beneficial for everyone. This is a beneficial, and they conceded to that, and this is a beneficial policy that everyone should have. Going on to this argument of economy, they have a lot of things in their mind. But first, let me quote facts again. We need to have at least uh, 5 million workers who are highly skilled in labor, in, uh, in finance, in tourism, and in business to fulfill the vision 2020 dream that we all uh, citizens of Malaysia have. But second rebuttal to this is that if we want to get a self-sustaining country, we need to start now. Not caring about other countries, not caring for the example of China, we need to understand what Malaysia is truly is, and that problem in Malaysia right now is that we don't have highly skilled labor. But going on that idea of vision 2020. We have a dream. And our dream is for us to achieve a self-sustaining country by, uh, by, uh, our, by ourselves. Let us achieve what we dream. Let us achieve the, uh, the, uh, the ability to fully self-sustain ourselves. Let us be provided with the amount of highly skilled labor that we, uh, highly skilled labor that we need. Let us win. Thank you. That was Mohammad Azizul Hazik bin Jalil as the third minister from the government bench. Now that the government has had its say, let us call for the opposition whip to counter all points put forth by the government bench. Please welcome Marina Binti Muhammad Hamdan. It is quite shameful to see that government's case isn't really as good as their looks. We see that either way, yeah, they may be good looking, but their case doesn't reflect so. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning, I bet, to everyone present. Today we are debating on the motion that this house believes that secondary schools should substantially expand vocational training. And I, as the third speaker from the opposition side, wholeheartedly agree to this motion. And I will rebut all the misguided points given to you by the government side and also summarizing the case brought to you by the opposition side. Opposition side has brought to you three major arguments, which is first, philosophy of secondary education, second, natural progression of economics, third, evolution of the job market. All three haven't been properly engaged by the government side. They've been harping on the problem without giving you a proper solution. Their solution is adding on vocational training to so-called expand a student's choice, but without actually expanding, without actually explaining what benefits does it give in the long run. They are just explaining things that what will happen if they go for tertiary education to further their studies 
there, but they haven't exactly seen the benefits of the long run of how us from the opposition side has proven to has has proven to you a lot of instances where we see that these industries have failed. So we want these students to actually be skilled in a lot of other aspects and creating a safety net, like we're, like we're saying, under our paradigm of how we are catering this to the best interest of students. Three issues coming from the third speaker. First, he wants to create an up employable students. But we see that first, it already happens under our case that we see that we're creating people to think that these students they will be more employable if they are able to think uh, which is status quo instead of going for their case which is actually giving vocational training which specifies on only one specific area <laughs> vocational training is only for one specific job and it's not lucrative let me give you an example right for example agriculture of how a student studies wheat so what if that certain industry Fails. What other choices do these students have? Because they haven't exactly expanded their skills into other ways because they are too busy with vocational training. Before that, yes. If they have SPM qualification and also a Malaysian skills certification qualification, and under your side, they won't have the skill part that we are proposing, and assuming they don't take agriculture, then what can they take on your case? Thank you. We see that under our part, regardless, that we are actually expanding a student's capability towards their fullest instead of them just focusing on one specific job, which is under their paradigm, which is what they are proposing. They want these students to be focusing because that is what vocational training is all about, which is something obviously they don't understand from the get-go. Sorry, piece it down. Second issue, which is choice of students, of how actually we're burdening these students. We're adding an, uh, another subject. They actually portrayed a picture that these students are so strong and they are all overestimating these students to be capable enough of adding another subject. But we see that how do you expect students to succeed in both theoretical and practical areas when they haven't even finished in theoretical parts in the first place? How do you expect them to expand in other ways when one part isn't even finished? So therefore, we are actually allowing them to completely expand their mentality throughout high school. So therefore, when they go through tertiary education, where they, actu they can actually do applications for them, which all they've skill their skills that they have applied in the first place. Moving on to the second speaker of two arguments coming from the second speaker. First is how they want to add on student education, of how it is disallowing them to pursue. We are not disallowing them to pursue, but basically the ratio of students who want to pursue in vocational studies and who don't want are very, very big in margin. We see that you are actually dis you are actually victimizing other students who don't even want to pursue in that certain education in the first place. So therefore, we don't see how you are protecting the students under your paradigm. That we see that under your paradigm, you are actually burdening students who are not even interested to start with because you are making it compulsory. Therefore, we see that under your paradigm, there will be a lot more harms. And therefore, our, under our case, that we are further mitigating the harms that happen throughout this whole case. Sorry, piece it out. Second issue, that you are expanding the choice of students. But firstly, we say that we are already allowing them to pursue in tertiary education. And they haven't even developed their fullest capability in, their first, in the first place. Because you are basically fast-forwarding their life. They actually haven't even completed their life of mentality. They haven't fully developed in their mentality in the first place. You are actually fast-forwarding their choices and hastening them to actually think about their future without making, giving them an informed choice. So therefore, we see that under their paradigm, that they have more harms under these students. And you are actually reducing the rights of a student to actually choose what they should or should not learn. That you are actually dictating how their life should be, of how you are tailor-suiting them to be robots of the country. We should see that these students are actually human, that we should protect their rights either way. Moving on to, to the last to the first speaker of how he brought up the point of purpose of education. Three particular issues under this point, which is first, outward mobility. Before that, yes. Now, government's duty is to provide students with choice to make legitimate choices. We don't think that full theoretical studies is under legitimate choices because it doesn't fulfill the purpose of education. 
to equip students with skills for upward mobility. Thank you. Actually, we see that under their paradigm that they say they want to so-called give them uh, an expansion in choice. But we see is that they are actually hastening a student's choice because vocational training is actually forcing you to make a decision right there and then, which is not what we want. We want these students to be exposed to every different sector, which is currently status quo. Our house of how status quo is having theoretical studies in high school to actually allow these students to completely enhance in their fullest capability, therefore they won't regret in making a choice in the long run. Moving on to the outward mobility of how it is a question of workers versus thinkers. We don't want to breed so-called robots like what they want under the government side. We want these students to be educated people regardless of what they're doing, that they, still in, they are still intelligent, that they can expand to other different sectors. We want these students to be able to think not to be able to work like mere robots. We want them to properly think and create new ideas every single day. <laughs> Secondly, they want to incentivize foreign investors. But we see that there's something funny about this particular issue, that even foreign investors would want to see if that industry is even worth investing in the first place, that they, not, they are not looking at the workforce available there. They want to see that if in that industry is even worth, worth taking a risk in the first place. So we see that under their paradigm, that that totally false. And we see that incentivized foreign investors doesn't work either way. So we see that at the end of the day, under our paradigm, we're actually helping these students to further their studies and actually keeping an open mind throughout high school. Not unlike their paradigm, which are di dictating a student's life to be something they don't re even want to be. They are creating robots for their selfish needs. So go for the opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. We have heard from the third speaker of the opposition bench. Now, ladies and gentlemen, now each team will be given three minutes to discuss their reply speeches. Thank you, timekeepers. I call the House to order once again. Members of this August House, this debate will resume with the reply speeches. From the opposition to sum up the case, I call upon Elmira Murni Binti Muhammad Harif. There were a lot of fine lines drawn in this debate. Today, in my reply speech, I'll summarize their case summarize our case, I'll draw to you the differences between our two cases and essentially which one's better, and you'll be convinced that side opposition will win. Let's cut to the chase. What exactly is it that side government proposed? They proposed that there'll be one vocational subject for every single student in Malaysia to take. Why? And these were the two points which they raised up. Number one, they wanted to create employability in students because that's what uh, education wants to do to you, right? And we have several responses to that. Number one, employability of students can already happen under status quo because you already teach people theory and practicalities. And you even have schools catered specifically to vocational training where you don't only learn vocational training only, but you also have to learn history and languages and other subjects too. So employability can already happen under status quo. But secondly, we tell you that for you to be employable, and if you want to take vocational training, we brought to you a fact which has gone disregarded. You need six hours of training a week. Given that you only have six days, um, five days of school days a week, you need to train these people for vocational training specifically every single day. If not, it won't be an effective training to begin with. So we tell you, you cannot create students which are effective in that sense even. But we tell you that vocational training, and this is the problem, creates you not to be employable in all sectors, but they only want to create a safety net for only one job. Meaning my only safety net now, and that's the only safety net they want to create, is for me to become a gardener or somebody who works in a factory. We tell you essentially, not only are these industries not needed anymore because you have machineries which replace people, but essentially you have to respect the right of a student to say, no, I don't want to learn this. Especially since it's already an industry which is dying and we're moving away. But the second issue that they brought is that students don't have a choice. They don't have a choice to balance themselves. And we rebutted 
by saying this. The choice is there. Because the fact is, if you want to take vocational or vocational pathway, you go to a vocational school where you can learn specific subjects that cater to this kind of learning, but you also need to learn history and languages and a lot of other things. That's when you create an equilibrium in education. Not when you force every single person to somehow create every and make everybody more employable. We don't see. Analyze what side opposition has brought with the debate today. We have three points. Number one, we've analyzed that the principles of secondary education means you prepare somebody based on their knowledge, not for them to become profitable only in one job. So essentially, their case goes against all the principles of secondary education. But secondly, there's a natural progression, even within our country, away from manufacturing industries and towards service-based sectors. Because there's a pro progression away from this, then how is that a lucrative or a safety net to begin with? Because we're not going to need it soon. In fact, we don't really need it now anyway. And in their case, you create what Stalin created when he victimized people by trying to over-subsidize and over-dramatize something that had no future to begin with, right? By the end of the day, the evolution of the job market means that you don't actually need to be trained specifically how to cut grass or how to cut care for you to be employable. You just need to learn theories because theories and practicals link. And when you learn theories, you can learn practicals. But when you learn practicals, you cannot learn theories. And that's why we say that to create an equilibrium that already exists, you'd go with side opposition. It's very clear. We don't want to force people into a choice they don't want to make, especially if that choice isn't a lucrative choice to begin with. That's the end say of that opposition. By the end of the day, it's been 11 years since any opposition has won this tournament. 11 years that has always been going to side government. We tell you that the girls from Seremban are proud to break that tradition. Thank you. That was Elmira Murni binti Mamad Harif summing up their case for the opposition bench. Now from the government who has the final say in today's debate, I call upon Abdul Razak bin Hazrin Fazail. There are two ineluctable realities in today's debate that opposition has turned a blind eye on. Number one, not all students who go to secondary school and take up a specific stream ends up going to tertiary education and furthering their studies. Secondly, not everyone wants to choose either or. Some individuals want to choose one and another and it's incorporated in the system which they learn on a daily basis. Those two realities were something opposition never tackled and never understood, which we consistently push them to answer from our side. Good morning, everyone. Let's just go on to a few things. My reply speech will be about four issues. Firstly, let's analyze theory versus practicality, because what they assumed was that theory is important. Now, what did we tell you? We told you that, look, theory is important, but it doesn't mean practicality isn't. There are labels on how vocational studies is archaic, is a dying industry, is not only an insult to those mechanics working in my proton company there, but also an insult to all those individuals who choose to go to vocational school. The reality is, vocational studies doesn't mean only mechanics people, it also means any other sector which employs based on a specific skill set, like welding, like um, sorry, like manufacturing, like services, like catering. And all this isn't necessarily being a mechanic, but it's also within something they tried to quote, the service industry, because that's what they wanted so much. Well, guys, let's um, news call. We can also provide that from our side. But let's go on. On top of that, what we told you was a few things. We told you that it doesn't mean when you take up vocational studies, you disregard theory all in all. You have a choice. And that plethora of options is what we provide from our side, something they don't. Secondly, capability of students. They were a bit rushy and ha hasty in this argument, taking the stance that it will be too burdensome because it's six hours a week, and therefore students can never cope. Number one, that means you're also disallowing students to choose excessive co-curricular activities, which we don't restrict students to take up. Secondly, we must understand one thing. All those vocational studies these students take up complements the stream that they take. That was the very case we put forth. That's why when you take science stream, you go for edu vocational studies which, are re which is related to your stream. And it's not, not going to be burdensome because you end up learning the same things and applying what you learn in theory to practicality. It's not a problem. 
Secondly, we also argued students' choice. There was no response as to what about the students who want to choose both. Because they keep on saying, well, there's a choice. You can choose either or. But my second speaker said, what about choosing both? What about those individuals? They are not doing anything for those individuals on the ground. Lastly, the na- uh, sorry, thirdly, the nation's economy. There was a misconception from their side. They thought that when you join the labor force, it means working in the construction sites only. Look, labor means profession, TKC. And the idea here is that learning vocational studies doesn't mean you can't think. Learning vocational studies doesn't mean you become a robot. That's an insult to those people who take up vocational studies. And I quote third speaker, that's what she said, that anyone who learns vocational studies becomes a robot. Well, I think by that logic, anyone who learns theory becomes non-moving objects who only know philosophy. Well, that's not the case, isn't it? Let's go on. We think that when it comes to employability, when it comes for the ability for a person to be employed, their side says that we need diverse options. But those options are provided on our side. That if you end up not going to tier 3 education, you can apply for that specific skill set. You can apply for being a paramedic. You can apply for being a manufacturer, which gets you more, which gets you more pay and develops the economy because the Malaysian sector is now filled with high-skilled workers. Something they didn't respond to. They just said, we don't need labor workers. Well, it's not that simplistic. Now, imagine yourself as a student taking a science stream in secondary school. But you end up failing that stream, you end up not getting an A in chemistry, and then you end up not qualifying for tertiary education. What happens to those individuals who can't qualify, who cannot choose to go to tertiary education, and has to be absorbed into the labor force? Those very individuals, are, those individuals are who we are saving in our case, where they can never predict the future, so we provide a safety net for them to fall back on. No safety net is worse than one safety net we provide. Thank you very much. That was Abdul Raza bin Hazrin Fazail summing up for the government. Ladies and gentlemen, the verbal war has been fought, and the battle of wits has run its course. Was that the 2012 English language debates for the Prime Minister's Challenge Trophy has come to an end. Thank you to the members of both benches and thank you ladies and gentlemen for being wonderfully attentive participants in today's debate. Now I would like to hand over the ceremony to the Master of Ceremony. Back to you, Encik Fauzi.